panel discussion on the history of the James Howe House here in Montclair. I'm Ariel Zeitlin, one of the librarians at the Montclair Public Library. And first, let me take care of a few housekeeping things. So um, the restrooms are here. There are exits, just in case, which we assume you won't have to use. And um, that's about it. Um, so getting back to the program, every program takes a village, but this one has gotten more help than most. And I'm so proud and so grateful to work with all of our partners on it, both inside and outside the library. Um, I want to give a shout out to Marisa Shari, our local history librarian, who was a big part of the planning. And I want you to know that she is available as a resource to all of you if you make, want to make an appointment to do genealogy or research your house or um, do uh, local research of any kind. Um, so thank you so much to our distinguished panelists, whom you'll soon meet, and also to the absolutely remarkable number of organizations and institutions that are co-hosting this event. The Friends of Howe House, of course, the Montclair History Center, the Montclair African American Heritage Foundation, the MARC, and the Universalist Unitarian Congregation of Montclair. We're also very grateful to all of you in the audience for coming. You'll get a chance to ask questions at the end of the discussion, so please save them for then. Um, please join me in welcoming our moderator for the evening, Dion Ford, the co-editor of Slavery's Descendants, Shared Legacies of Race and Reconciliation, and the author of the forthcoming book, Go Back and Get It, a memoir of race, inheritance, and intergenerational healing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited for this panel. And um, just to let you know my connection to the Howe House, uh, I am a member of the board of the Friends of the Howe House. So I'm looking forward to introducing our panelists to you. And when I introduce you, you can also just let our guests know how you are connected to the Howe House as well, OK? I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. Um, Dr. James Ammon Massour serves as research specialist at the New Jersey Historical Society and teaches political science at Rutgers, New York. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> and James, can you just let us know how you're connected to the Howe House? Yes, um, I am connected to the uh, Howe House through Betty. Uh, Betty called the Historical Society asking for information. Uh, about this particular house, and that's how I got connected. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. And Janice Gilliard is the president of New Jersey chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, a member of the New Jersey Genealogical Society and the National Genealogical Society, as well as a charter member of the Harriet Tubman chapter of Sons and Daughters of the U.S. Middle Passage. She's also a descendant of the Howe and Crane families. And I am a proud team member of the James Howe House, and um, being involved in loving history and genealogy, it's really, really important. And my note is, the James Howe House is important and special to me because of its historical significance. It is a part of American history, and there continues to be a legacy and story to research, share, document, and preserve, and I'll share more later. Thank you so much, James. Betty Holloway, a retired teacher, is a member of the Montclair African American Genealogy Group and the Montclair African American Heritage Foundation. She has created several projects about Montclair's African American community that reflect her interest in genealogy and historical research. Uh, my invo involvement uh, with the Howe House came through the Montclair African American Heritage Foundation. We are partners with the organization, and in a meeting we decided this was a project that we wanted to be involved with very much. And because I love research, um, I was a natural. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Betty. And finally, we have Jeffrey Zielstra, 
an associate professor of his history at one of the City University of New York colleges. His research includes the formation of free black neighborhoods in New York City and Philadelphia. Hello. Um, I got looped into the, I'm, I'm a member of the Friends of the Howe House, and I got looped into this project last spring uh, when, through the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair, when they were looking for someone to help with the application for historic preservation for the house. Uh, I've since been involved in some of the historical research and uh, writing of the historical content on the website. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. So let's dig in. So um, I guess first, if we can just start, um, and each of you can just tell me how the James Howe House fits into the history of Montclair. Well, okay. well, just based on a bit of research that I've been able to do, um, in a couple of years, America will celebrate its founding, 250 years. The Howe House has been around, we think, since 1780. We still have to do a little more research. So that would fit um, naturally Montclair and the Howe House in the celebration of the founding of America. That would be number one. Um, the other part was when we found the manumission records for James Howe from 1817, um, meaning that his enslavers freed him um, I think that's a very significant um, turning point um, because in my research, I haven't come across that too much. You know? And when I say that in my research, uh, I'm particularly thinking about my own family history, genealogy. You know, I reached what they typically call the brick wall for African Americans. We can go back to 1870, but any further than that is um, a hard task. Um, also, the fact that the enslaver, in his will, um, willed James Howe a parcel of land. So when did we hear about land and a house um, being bequeathed? to an enslaved person. The one that we're most familiar with is, is the 40 acres and a mule, right? 1865, but not 1833, right? So those are just a few of the things. Uh, oh, one other thing um, with the Howe family. Uh, it looks like uh, James Howe's son served a year in the Civil War. So that is significant as well. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other, anyone else want to add any other um, thoughts on how the Howe House fits into the history of Egypt? Sure. I, I think it's important to recognize that the Crane family is involved in the story. Uh, and, and when we look at the development of Montclair as a town, the Crane family has been credited as, as being the founding family. Um, and they were slave owners. You know, there was enslaved people that were working with the Cranes. And when we think about the development of Montclair then, uh, we have another group of people that is not recognized with regard to Montclair's history and Montclair's development. So making that connection through the Howe House, I think, is really important uh, because we're, we're looking at, at African Americans going back to the very early development of Montclair as a town and the roles that they played in that, often, often hidden historically. And um, if I may add uh, to that, um, which is to give you the broader context. We're talking about the Crane family um, going back to the founding of Newark. Uh, and then, of course, the earliest evidence we've, we are aware of of people of African descent in Newark dates back to 1721. 
Uh, and when you look through the records of Newark, you also see a number of claims in Newark uh, involving slave holding as well. Uh, and so that's very important that we made that dimension to it because at some point in the 17th century, 18th century, let me say, largely, um, Newark was what is Essex County today. Uh, and so, or Essex County today was largely what Newark was in the 18th century at some point. So when we are talking about Montclair, we're also talking about Newark going back. And the cranes have a very deep road all the way. So to piggyback on that, so with him saying um, the Crane family has very deep roots, I live in Summit. I am originally from South Carolina. And so when um, there was an effort to purchase the home, the James Howe House, and to uh, bring awareness to the local community, extended communities, the media, I was there. Prior to that, I've been doing some research to try to bring um, James Howe and his family to bring them forward, and I've been successful, found some information that I had. And so at one point, though, I was stuck. And out of the blue, and I love sharing the story, out of the blue, it was like, take the Crane family and put it into your DNA matches. And I'm like, but I'm not working on that. I'm trying to work on James Howe and his descendants. And I did it, and I was stunned to find someone from South Carolina living in some of New Jersey to find out that I actually have several DNA matches to descendants of the Crane family. So my question obviously is, okay, so you know, what are all of the places that the Crane, where are the various places that the Crane family, where were they? I have a family coming out of Connecticut. Um, Betty Holloway has found research where there are Cranes that were in Connecticut that came to New Jersey. So I am on a mission to figure out what is that connection. I also have how DNA matches. So being an avid researcher and based on my experience, when you have an enslaver giving money and land to someone who's enslaved, all right, there's typically a connection. And so I'm on a mission to find out what that connection is. And I will, I see a lot of you smiling going, mm, basically, <laughs> because it wasn't like, oh, wow, I just feel like being kind to you. That is not historically what I have found. So a real shocker about how all that came about. And then speaking of Montclair, um, I happened to be in a bookstore purchasing other books. And I was led to the back of the store. And these newsletters were on top of a table. And they highlight the Crane family. Um, enslaved people are referenced. And so I just feel, my take is a little bit different, that all of this is supposed to be happy, happening and that the truth will be revealed and we will know how James, how, how they were really, really, really connected. So we believe in proving it out, having three or four pieces of evidence, and I believe that that's going to happen. Leave it to the genealogists. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I heard reference of James Howe's son, which is amazing. That was my first time hearing about that. So maybe you all can tell us what we do know about James Howe himself. I think you're the expert. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, in brief, um, as early as 1840, let's see, we think James Howe was born around 1785. And he may have lived in that house when George Washington passed by it <laughs> in uh, around 1787 on his way to a meeting at one of the Cranes' homes with uh, General Lafayette. <laughs> so, so he may have been living in the house. So we know that. So we also. Um, know that as early as 1840, James Howe, um, in the census records, was listed as blind. And I discovered from reading another account of James Howe that he did have diabetes. Um, I learned that uh, many of the Crane descendants loved to be around James Howe because he told many wonderful stories about the history of the family. The Crane family, that is. <laughs> um, so 
his son, James Henry Howe, um, only served one year, 1864 to 1865. And um, we don't have his actual record, but he was um, listed in the New Jersey, the book for New Jersey for Civil War um, draftees. And he was listed with the colored troop. And when he was drafted, um, the drafter did not include Newark in the drafting of men for the Civil War. It was Sussex, Morris, Passaic, Bergen, and Bloomfield, where the draft records, um, where uh, individuals were drafted. Um, so, um, we, we, what I also find absolutely fascinating is that James Howe left a will. And we don't know, you know, many African Americans who at that time were leaving a will, but he had property from um, what had been left to him by Major Nathaniel Crane. And so, his descendants, which would have been James Henry Howe and um, his daughter Delilah, uh, who married a Jackson, um, they, the property remained in that family until later in the 1800s, sort of the late 1800s. I don't remember the date right now. So those are just a few things, and we're still uncovering things, and there's still more information that we need to find out about James Howe. And we did learn also that his family had, he was a descendant of other family members who had served, in, who had been enslaved by the Crane family. So we don't know what that means, you know, because generations, you know, how much time would generations be? Yeah. So now the genealogist in me is going to reach out to my contact at the National Archives and see if there's a pension file for him because in the pension file records, there's so much information where they will talk about their, who they were married to, um, when they were born, their parents. I have two for a different line of my family, so I'm excited now to know that, to go get that pension file, if it exists, if one exists. Mm -hmm. Um, and, wow, so he had two children, a, a son and a daughter. That's what we know right now. We're still, still looking. And, We're and, still looking. And both of them lived on the six-acre property. So, right. so um, James Howe inherited six acres, and that property is divided up over generations. And uh, you can see his children's names on, on pieces of the property, well, Delilah's husband, but um, are, are there. So, I mean, it's an interesting story of, of how this family used this property to create wealth for themselves to, to survive uh, in, in, in an intergenerational way, which I think is also important in terms of how we think about and analyze African American history in the United States. So there's a lot going on with this family that we can use to understand broader U.S. history as well. Mm -hmm. And that makes me wonder about something that I've heard and maybe other people in the audience have heard about the house being kind of a nucleus of the, like, of the black um, neighborhood or black life in the town. What do we know about that? Is that true? How much information do we have about that? So we're still working on that. Uh, and I don't know that we can be conclusive about this. So there was two, so we have the census records and there's two black families that are living there quite, quite early after Howe inherits this property. Uh, the Howes and then the Olivers are living next door. And then how, as I mentioned before, has two children, and then the property is split, and then they're both living on the property as well. And we just learned on Monday that there was a reverend in Newark who also owned a piece of property, and his name was, I wrote that down in somewhere. Thompson. Thompson. Thompson, yeah, Thompson. So, so 
you know, is for properties a neighborhood, you know, so that, you know, and we need to do more research in, into this question. So in my own personal research, I've looked at the development of black neighborhoods in other areas, uh, Philadelphia uh, much more than Montclair. And what we see in places like Philadelphia and also in, in Brooklyn, there's a neighborhood called Weeksville, is that there's a lot of, of renters there. And, you know, Benny talked about how you kind of run into a wall, you know, when you start going back because there's not records that have been collected well for, for black people. And property owners are easier to find. There's deeds, their names are on maps. So my question as a researcher is, were there renters on this property? And, and right now there's no evidence that there was. So, you know, I, I can't say that there was a community there of, of more than just the properties that we've identified on this map. Um, but I think that's where research needs to happen. And it's possible that the answer to that is, is just no, you know, that there wasn't really a community there. But if we can find that, that you know, the, the property was used in bigger ways than just the names on the map, you know, then we'll come to a different conclusion. But, but we're at a very preliminary place in that research, and, and we can't really say that there was a black community there. But, you know, based on previous research that I've done about Montclair, I don't believe that you could characterize it as a community. However, I do feel that you can characterize it as a family of a, the beginning of a, the Montclair community, mm -hmm. and not a community on that six acre of property that is separate and apart from what Montclair became. Because we did, you know, and from other researchers, uh, like our town historian, um, we know that there were other slaves, there were farm laborers, uh, there were house servants, um, and other people in the town were being manumitted. We just have to get a handle on that. But we, I feel, just based on previous research, that it was not a separate community. But there were, they were a family that lived in that location. Well, Jeff mentioned earlier about records, right? So in my research, when you look at wills, and you, you know, most of them, they would list their enslaved people. So then you look at the neighbors. Um, and they're enslaved people, and I think you can build off of that. So I, I do believe that they existed, they just weren't documented well, or that it's scattered and you have to pull resources together and, and come up with, okay, what, what was it really like? So I think, I think they were communities, but the information is just scattered and we'll have to put it together. That's our job, is to be able to tell that story. One of the um, notes that I made was I said, um, and I said it earlier, I said it's so important, I said there continues to be a legacy and a story to research, share, document, and preserve. And I honestly feel that all of that information, based on just what we're finding so far, we're going to find it. I think our ancestors want, to, want us to find them in historical record sets, and it's starting to happen. And this was unplanned, me going into this bookstore, sitting right there. And there's a lot of information in these newsletters. So... I think that the stories one, will come together. One of the things that I have found is uh, indeed records mm -hmm. that I have obtained was uh, Major Nathaniel Crane's will was probated in 1837. And in 1844, James Howe sold a quarter of an acre to a Francis Oliver. After that, year after year after year, uh, a number of transactions occurred um, from sales that occurred of that six acre of land. So we do have deeds um, that we can look at, that we need to uncover and read over and understand just what were those transactions. Sure. Yeah. James, did you want to add something? Yes, yes, I think, um, yeah, oh, thank you. Um, yes, the fragments of the past, we're still putting them together. And so that's a job we all have to be engaged in to make the history of our communities exactly. and the history of the country very complete. You know, we have just incomplete history as of now. But the term community, um, I th 
Take, for instance, my research has shown, or what we know broadly about Newark, for instance, as an example, there was a black community in Newark. And you can see what makes truly a community. A community, my understanding, is not just a group of people living, but they also have their institutions, or churches, and other institutions broadly that serve them. So when you take a look at Newark, in the 19th century, for instance, they had their own churches, at least three black-owned churches. They had their own anti-colored, um, uh, anti-slavery society in Newark, which we just don't know. So they had institutions to serve them as well. So in terms of Montclair, I'm not quite sure, uh, as Janice said, and as Betty said, I think more research needs to be done to really establish whether there was a community, not only of a group of people living close by, but with their institutions to serve them. So when you bring up Newark and the Anti-Slavery Society, I think we also know that the Underground Railroad passed through Newark certainly, as well. Certainly. So then that brings up the question of whether the Howe House has a connection to the Underground Railroad, which is also some, you know, you've, we've heard, or at least I've heard, that that's a possibility. So what do we know about that? Anything? Well, um, I do a lot of, um, you know, research. I'm actually doing uh, collecting runaway slave ad advertisements in New Jersey's own newspapers. And New Jersey was the last of the 13 colonies to begin to publish its own newspapers continuously. And this was during the Revolutionary War, 1777. So I am working, collecting these advertisements uh, to show the, the geography, of uh, geography of slavery in New Jersey, for instance. So as far as I know, um, I don't know about any underground railroad station in, in Montclair, but there's a possibility. Because to have an underground railroad station, uh, it's, it's, underground railroad station is just a connection, it's just a network of people, both black and white, uh, like-minded people who are working to free people and move them into freedom as far as possible. So personally, I don't know about any a connection to Montclair, but we do know Newark definitely there was an underground, underground railway station built by a man called Jacob King uh, in 1830, and the Newarkers founded their own um, colored anti slavery society in Newark in 1834, and they were determined to uproot slavery completely. Of course, they had opposition, so that's what I can see. Uh, I don't know any evidence about Montclair. How about our other panelists? <laughs> um, through, with the help of the Montclair History Center, I know about plans for a railroad to go through that area and would have gone through the property of the Howe and the Olivers. An actual railroad. Yes, yeah. But plans were squashed because of the financial crisis of uh, 1873. So that's about it that I know about a railroad and plans for a railroad. But I do understand what James and Janice are saying about people connections, and I'm anxious to hear that myself. Well, when you think about the history of the Underground Railroad, they couldn't say, oh, hey, exactly. here's the Underground Railroad, you know. So there are, um, in talking to um, historian uh, Frank Godlewski, there are a lot of different places that um, people spoke about that were on the Underground Railroad. And I believe that in Montclair and other surrounding communities that they existed. Um, I have actually been to the Bloomfield Steakhouse. I don't know how many of you have been there, but if you go there, they have a little card. And I've actually seen it. Um, Fox, 5 Dan, Fox 5's Dan Bowens um, did a piece on it. And we actually went downstairs. And at first, like a lot of people were taking, some of the group, they were taking pictures. I didn't feel comfortable. It took me a minute because I just felt like that was a sacred space. And after about five or 10 minutes, I was able to breathe. I actually, for me, I felt the presence of ancestors, um, not necessarily my own. And then it was just this feeling of, it's okay. It's okay to be able to see that and to know that a lot of us are here because a lot of our ancestors, they survived, they were resilient, and they were determined, and they had help. So um, I know a lot of other people that do research on the Underground Railroad. Um, my husband is a pastor at Corinthian Baptist Church in Jersey City, and someone came to me and said that they'd done research and said, did you know 
that that was a stop? And I'm like, uh, no. So how much history is out there in Montclair and other locations that we don't even know about that people stop talking about? So now that we're having this conversation, this discussion, I think that it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity to research and tell that truth and to correct any historical narratives that, oh, no, well, it wasn't documented. Somebody wrote about it. Just like with slavery, you know, if you're doing research, people will say, oh, well, it, and as Betty said, it's challenging and you get brick walls, but it's not impossible. I've been able to trace family back to 1720. Why? Because enslaved people were considered property and you kept track of your property and your money. So I think that there are records. I think people have, may have things in their homes that they may feel uncomfortable sharing, diaries, Bibles, and uh, journals that talked about, I, I have a lot for my family, so I am here to blow that away, that if you're researching your ancestors or the Underground Railroad, I think the information does exist. It's just, are people willing, that have it, are they willing to share? So a dear friend that's a team member has a family Bible from the 1700s. We met in Montclair at this library in another room, and he shared that Bible with me. How many of you have Bibles? of your ancestors, and you may be afraid and uncomfortable, or again, journals that may talk about the Underground Railroad. As an avid family researcher, it is like life and air to us when you share that information. So again, I'm hold, sticking to my story that the information is gonna be revealed. Somebody will hear us having this conversation and saying, you know what, I've got a trunk with information in it. The worst story I ever heard was that two people, one black, one white, the white person said, oh, I've got all this information and wanted to share it, went back and told her family, and they made her burn it. They made her burn it. So my thing is, we can have this conversation, no matter who we are, we're better together. We don't have to be afraid. And when we correct the historical narrative and tell the truth and document and share our stories, I think we'll all be better for it. I'd like to highlight something that James said about the Underground Railroad and that, that there was uh, black and white actors. Right. And one of the narratives I think that's really strong in the way education operates is that it's white conductors uh, who you know, are white people that are opening their homes to black people that were escaping. And uh, recent research, you know, Eric Foner wrote a book uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago that really highlighted the importance of free black people right. who were helping the you know, folks who were escaping slavery from the South. And this is something that I think we need to do a better job with because the larger narrative about the Underground Railroad is that it's, it's benevolent white people, Quakers for example, that are helping folks escape. And, and when you look at the numbers of people who were escaping, well first I want to point out that the the number of people who escaped on their own is far, far higher than the number of people who escaped through the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, that also needs to be, you know, emphasized when we're studying the past. And if you read a book, you know, for example, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, here's a man who, who planned for years to escape and did it on his own. And, and those sorts of stories need to be emphasized. And the stories of people like William Still, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my hand, uh, there's abolitionist societies in Pennsylvania and New York that really were critical to helping organize the Underground Railroad. And it's, it's the black people that worked for, the free black people that worked for those abolitionist societies. And you may remember you know, uh, the names. But, but they're the ones that were the key actors in making this happen. However, the way these stories are told, particularly in our, in our public schools, is that it's, it's white heroes that are helping black people, and it's simply not accurate. Thank you. Uh, if I may add to that, um, there was a, a case in Newark in 1793, and also connects to one of the cranes, uh, Jedediah Crane. He's a slave person who ran away, uh, a woman in his, her 40s. Her name was Phyllis, and he was supposed to be, have been led by a free black man called James Arcus to run away from Newark in 1793. So yes, the original abolitionists were the fugitives themselves. They were not waiting for people to help them, but they were the original abolitionists uh, trying to get. So that has also connection with a, a crane in Newark. We're talking about the cranes in Montclair, 
But the craze in Newark, 1793, we have evidence of that. Yeah, and I uh, also read someplace, and this is incomplete uh, research on my part, that a lot of the um, slaves who were, uh, the enslaved people who were running away ended up in South Jersey, where South Jersey had um, um, a big problem with the influx of so many of the uh, fugitives landing there in Gloucester uh, County, Burlington County, and you know, and the like, places like that. So um, New Jersey had a, a different or a special problem. And I think a couple of names that I remember that you were mentioning uh, was um, um, McKim, his last name is McKim, James McKim, who was a big abolitionist, and uh, William Lloyd uh, Garrison. Yeah, so they would be people who worked with uh, William Still. I'm so As, glad everyone brought up William Still because mm -hmm. he's really from New Jersey. That's where he was born. Yeah. <laughs> so we can share some Jersey pride. <laughs> um, actually, and so. Uh, the cranes were brought up again, and um, I guess one question that I neglected to ask earlier when you were talking about both your how and crane ancestry was, uh, what do we know about the relationship between James Howe and the cranes? Um, people have, you, you know, talked a bit about it, but um, do we know anything more besides what maybe folks speculate about their connection? Not yet, <laughs> but I'm working well, on it. Yeah. Most of the, the information that I get would be stories that um, from reading a Henry Whitmore's book, 1894, published, and also Philip Doremus. Uh, they talk about James Howe, they tell stories about James Howe, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm just wondering is, if this will be our link to find out if the stories that they are telling, if we can find a connection in the research. You know, so that we can say, yeah, here it is, you know, mm -hmm. in black and white. Maybe, but maybe not, because <laughs> a lot of times they were not going to, I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. um, in South Carolina, I was researching someone, okay, and just could not find who his father was. So I was like, all right, let me look at the land. He had 150 acres of land. In the, in the um, document that I found, he was sold that land for a dollar. Well, all the black people in that particular community where he lived, when they died, they were buried in the enslavers um, in his cemetery. And then he was signing off on all of the, do um, the death certificates. And then there, were, um, there was land that was exchanged with other people that were members of the family, and they all had attorneys. I'm going, mm, what is that? So a lot of times, again, I go back to what I said earlier, when you see that, there's some type of relationship there. Uh, one woman um, in my family, another woman um, that was enslaved, uh, PBS did a special about her. And so I found the will of her enslaver, and he's looking out for three of his enslaved people and going, oh, I want him to go here, I want him to go there. And like you could just tell that there was some care. Then there were five other people listed, and it's like, yeah, you can sell them. So to me, when, some, when you're giving something based on the research that I've done over, the, over 30 years, Normally, and DNA is telling on everybody. Nobody counted on DNA. Nobody. Like, you know, a, a dear friend of mine said, when you take a DNA test, you put everybody on blast. So, and it's true. That's why I have European. I have uh, indigenous Native American, right? Then I have African American. I embrace all of it. But it's there. And again, no one counted on that. And all these questions that I've had for years are being answered by DNA and various matches. One line, um, which is white, goes back to the 1500s. How is that happening? Of some relationships took place that were not written down. So I think in some cases, maybe if somebody wrote about it, you will find it. In other cases, they weren't sitting there going, "Okay, I slept with my enslaved person." They're not saying they're not doing that. But if they're if they're if they're leaving land to them, doing something for them, I just think it's more than I really like them because they served them. They were you know they they were enslaved. I enslaved them. Their parents lived in my house. They lived in my house. I'm going to be nice. I don't think that that was the case. I just don't. The, the, the timeline for the relationship here is an interesting timeline also. And as Betty said a few minutes ago that James Howe was manumitted in 1817. 
and the will, Nathaniel, and Nathaniel Crane manumitted him, but we were speculating uh, on, on Monday that whether or not Nathaniel Crane manumitted him himself or on behalf of the Crane family. So we were wondering who actually was the owner. Uh, but then the will is written in, in 1831. So there's a fairly large gap there between 1817 when Howe was manumitted and 1831 when the will. So what's happening in, in that intervening period there? Why didn't you know, James Howe leave Montclair, right? So he stays here even though he's, he's a free person. And then Nathaniel Crane, I, th I think we, we've got him dying in 1833, but I'm not 100% sure on that date. Yeah, that's so that's, that's two years after the will is written. Mm -hmm. so, so it's unclear exactly what's going on with the James Howe house. You know, when, when is James Howe living in it? Was he living in it this entire time? Did he live in it after he inherited it? Did that happen in 1831 or 1833? So there, there's a lot of, of questions here. But for me, it's a really interesting question, you know, Janet. Jeff, I'm why, listening. I'm why, listening to you. Who can he, a slave person? Oh, I'm going to give you a house. That's deep. Uh, so why, <laughs> why did he stay here between 1817 and, eight, and the early 1830s? And, and I don't know that we, you know, Janice is being, you know, a little coy with this. <laughs> but um, but we, we don't really know the for struggle sure is what's, real what's here. going on here. We don't know well, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. One of the things we haven't mentioned, and maybe... Um, James will speak to this more, is the 1804, in 1804, New Jersey passed the Gradual Abolition Act. Yes. And so I am just wondering, since the Cranes were lawmakers and New Jersey leaders, you know, you know how much were they following the law? <laughs> or just, you know, what was happening? And um, I think there were various things that was going on at that time where all of the slave owners during that Gradual Abolition Act, they had to register. Is that right? Yes. They had to register their slaves in Essex County. So, and in all the counties in New Jersey, I think, right? Yes, so New Jersey was the last of the northern states to pass uh, what became the Gradual Abolition of Slavery Law. Um, Last because uh, New Jersey is also a southern state and a northern state at the same time. The geography of New Jersey stretches all the way. The southern tip of New Jersey touches even beyond Baltimore. And so northern culture feeding into a state at the same time as the northern, uh, southern culture and the northern culture interacting. So 1804, New Jersey passed this gradual abolition of slavery law. But it's stipulated that Anybody who was born on the 4th of July, 1804, and after that, will be a free person, but that person will serve the owner of his or her mother until if he, were, he, was, a, uh, he was 25 years, then he could gain his freedom. If he's a woman, 21 years. So that made things very complicated. But one other requirement was that the owner of the new child or the baby will have to register that with the county clerk. So we have registration, but not everybody obeyed that. Uh, it's very, really complicated. There's a book out there written by uh, James Gigantino uh, II called Ragged Road to Abolition. It's about the struggle to end slavery in New Jersey, and it traces it from 1775 through 1865. But one other thing we're not quite sure about, no, not sure about, we have not really established is that slavery did not even end in 1865 with the 13th Amendment. It actually ended officially on the 23rd of January, 1866, <coughs> when a new governor, Governor Marcus Ward of Newark, signed an amendment to abolish slavery in New Jersey forever. So 1804 was a gradual abolition of slavery, but it took a long time for slavery to really died in New Jersey. Uh, so that gives you how complicated it was because it was very political. Southern, southern interest, northern interest, all colliding at the same time. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I know we're supposed to open up, but I just wanted to hear one final word from each of you before we open up to the audience on what is the significance of this house, um, not just in Montclair history, but in um, 
the state of New Jersey as well as the United States. How special is this structure? So I, I think there's a lot here. Uh, I think that we don't have many artifacts that we can use to study black history in the United States. You know, they've, they've been erased. Uh, I was this past summer at the Museum for Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there's not artifacts there. They use augmented reality as a way of presenting spaces that black people occupied. And you know that we have an artifact here in Montclair uh, is, is really significant. And there's very few opportunities to have what we have here. So that's, that's a big deal, you know, this, this object of black material culture. Uh, I, I think as a historian that works in this century, thinking about the expansion and experience of freedom for black people is really important. And this house is a touchstone to explore those themes. So, you know, I mean, these are, these are the best themes in social history, and we're going to be able to do that here in Montclair through the James Howe House. Yes, I think the significance is out there. Um, a house once owned by a formerly enslaved person in New Jersey. Uh, I think this is this is what we can claim to. I mean, this is the oldest because uh, there is one that we know about was built in 1845, Lone uh, by Peter Moore. Uh, that is still standing, but you know this is a great. We we're not quite sure, but as far as we know, as of now, and of course. More research needs to be done, but this is a very important place, important building. Um, and in the broader context, we have people of African descent owning property in New Jersey, going back to at least the 18th um, cent century. Uh, there, are, there are evidence of black men, one about 200 acres in Berger County, you know, leasing that. Uh, another one about 400 acres by 1740 in Bergen County, he was leasing that. So we have evidence of people owning it, owning things. Of course, there is also a family in Monmouth County, broadly, that had land by 1809, uh, quite a lot of, uh, you know, tract of land. But in terms of a standing building, building that is still there, I think you probably have the claim. I'm not saying this 100%, but it looks like this is the <laughs> oldest you know, structure ever owned by a formerly enslaved person. I could be wrong, but I'm saying this with caution. <laughs> with caution. Okay. I, I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. For me, it's that he was a landowner. You know, that his family was here in Montclair at the time of the revolution that and that was significant because the Cranes were patriots, not loyalists. I don't know if you could have found very many loyalists in, you know, in this area. And the fact that his son, I think uh, Congress enacted um, the fact that blacks could serve in the Civil War in 1862. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, Congress. Yeah, it, it was legislated in 1862. And for him to have been drafted in 1863, and then he served in 1864, uh, I think that's very significant, you know, in terms of fighting for the freedom of African Americans in this country. And that's bone chilling to me. And um, one of the things that I found that was very personal to me for the Oliver family who had purchased uh, a quarter of an acre was that the last heir um, in, in that family was one of the founders of St. Mark's United Methodist Church, my church. So, so I'm, you know, uh, to me, uh, the significance of the Howe House and the family that dwelled there is, um, you know, something that we just cannot let go. So I'll try and make this as quick as possible. So you have freedom seekers, and I believe that all of us are conversation starters, truth seekers. Um, the James Howe House 
just sparks within me this question, how many other stories are out there like his story? And where, you know, we may be a little challenged or believe that, oh my gosh, it's going to be so hard to find out. I, I, I disagree. In this newsletter, it talks about the last slave in Crane Town and talks about the enslaved person coming from Africa. And so it's very, very emotional because I feel that our stories are out there, that they are in documents like a newsletter that can lead to something else. And so I just pray that it's not like, oh, wow, we're doing this, and then we forget about, well, we're not going to let that happen. But, you know, <laughs> and look sure. at a group of people who found out about the How James Howe house, that it was going to be sold, and they pulled together in a matter of weeks and, and did everything possible now that the house has been sold and belongs to that whole team, the James Howe house team. That is, it just speaks to coming together and making it happen coming together and finding the document. So you can't tell me if this is here, what else is out there? What else is out there? So I think it's our job to continue to research, document, and share, and tell a story. So James Howe House is very, very important, I think, to all of us and can bring us together. So. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kick off the questions because there's one more question that Janice alluded to, which I want to ask, which is, can you tell us a little bit about um, how the Friends of Howe House wound up purchasing the house? Because that's now part of the history of the house. And an exciting chapter, too. Oh my gosh. Who wants to take that? <laughs> well, I already shared about people um, this isn't a church service, but there's a scripture that the people had a mind to work. And how can, two, how can two walk unless they agree, right? Walk together. You have a small group of people that decided we're going to do this. And we were able to mobilize other people and different organizations to come together to make it happen. And I'm going to be very honest. I was like, ooh, this is going to be challenging. But then I said a prayer, and people kept having the conversations, working together. How can we do it? And... It happened. It happened. So to me, a group of people coming together and agreeing that we can do this. What do we need to do? Let's do a fundraiser. Fundraisers. Who can we partner with? And people saw that, and it worked. Can you just um, explain a little bit about what happened? So the building had been privately owned all this time, and then... Well, it was stated that they weren't going to sell it. The owner wasn't going to sell it, and then he changed his mind. <laughs> so somebody else, I don't want to take a point on. I mean, I, there's probably people in the audience that are better suited to answer this question than we are here. Yeah. But, but Dion, I think you were early. I mean, you were you were one of the people early on that said, "Hey, there's this house. We need to do something about it." And then, and then there was some folks in Montclair that, that connected with you, Janice, you and Frank Godlewski, who have been working on this for quite a long time. And then people and, like and Betty and, and the, right. the historical yeah, and, and stuff. And there so, were all these groups that have been working on, you know, finding information and, and preserving the story of this, of this right. precious place yeah. for we, decades. We have to uh, <laughs> acknowledge that the Montclair Public Library and Marissa who helped me tremendously. Uh, also Angelica at the yes. Montclair History Center. Um, these organizations are very important and uh, they've kept the stories, they've helped us to pull it together. But, uh, but yes, so yes, just as Betty's saying, so all, the, all of these different societies and organizations right. have been working over decades, I would right. say, right? To right. know about this history, to preserve this history. I came upon it after I lived here for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Someone who loves history, I mean, that's my thing. And I only came upon it because I was doing my own family history, right. like Janice, and um, happened to do a sleepover in a slave dwelling and wow. in Connecticut, which was bringing attention to northern slave owning, you know, that, that the North had held slaves, and um, through a conversation with some of the other people who had been on the sleepover as well, realized that I didn't know anything about Montclair's own history of uh, slavery. 
And uh, so when I got home, I reached out to the Mont what was then the Montclair Historical Society, now the History Center, and their then director, Jane um, Eliasov, um, told me what she knew about slavery in Montclair and what she knew about James Howe. And I, you know, walked over there just to kind of pay homage to this structure that was still standing. And then years later, just like last year, when my uh, lovely co-minister at my congregation, Reverend Anya, who's in the audience, I was going to say, we can't forget <laughs> it, we can't when she yeah. said to me and, and asked me to, you know, connect with the social justice team over there and said, so what should we be thinking about and working on? What do we need to know about in our community in terms of social justice? I said, I don't know, but there is this one house that I think we all need to know about. And um, all of a sudden, I was hearing how people were having meetings and, you know, people were getting together and all of this cross-pollinization was happening, so. It, it, it felt it, very organic, yes, it, it, it did. Yeah, I mean, absolutely organic. And, and it went in a matter of months from trying to obtain historic preservation status, which would right. mean a rock with a plaque on it, right, to, to benefactors, bridge builders, loaning money to purchase it. And, you know, Betty is absolutely right that it, it was an organic and a very fast and furious process. Okay, well that's that's really exciting, and um, I think Marissa Marissa is here, and I believe we actually have we own in our local history collection those yes. newsletters. Mm -hmm. So if someone is interested in them, they can take a look at them under Marissa's uh, watchful supervision. <laughs> so um, I'm going to open it up to questions <coughs> now. I'm just wondering, do you have any documentation on when and how? It left the Howe family, how it be, went into per, um, private hands. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, there is, uh, yes, deeds. Um, they are on record here. Okay, but what, out of ground, what period of time? When did it? Um, I think the sale of the house occurred in. By Theorem Oliver in 1904. Oh. And so, so there are records after that. So since 1904, it's been in private hands other than the family. Right. This is about the house. Can you tell us about the house? How large is it? I have gone past it at least 10,000 times. I notice it's tiny compared to the house to its east, which is massive. How many rooms does it have? How many square feet? How large is the piece of property? Can you tell us any of that information? I can't. <laughs> I mean, you've seen that it's a small structure. Um, I mean, we were talking about that. We had a meeting on Monday, a few of us, and, and you know, our understanding actually is the, the rear part, which is the kitchen now, was actually the part that James Howe inherited, and that the front was built later, and I don't know the date on that, but it would have even been a fraction of the size that you see now. Um, so it, it was a two bedroom, uh, it's now a one bedroom, the bedroom is upstairs, there is a kitchen in the back, and there's a living dining area in the front, and I don't know the square footage on it, but it's, it's not a lot. Someone else? These are all great questions, by the way. The stairway going to the second floor is about that big, that wide. <laughs> Hi, Betty, did you find anything about um, his wife, James Howe's wife? No, we talked about that at our meeting on uh, Monday, and the sad story that I have was what I said earlier. I've been looking for my great-great-grandmother for maybe about 20 years. And, I'm, and we, uh, we have not resolved that we cannot find Susan, but Jane, it's nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> um, no, we haven't. And uh, Mike is on the team with us, our town historian, Mike Farrell, and um, he is furiously looking, as well as I am. So we have no clue. And that often happened to women, and I think Janice may be able to um, 
um, agree with me on that, was that the women often, their last names and their attachments were lost. Challenging. Yeah, it, and it's very challenging to find them because they became known in their husband's names. So, I haven't found anything. I wish. Another question? I have a question for you. Uh, Betty, this is directed to Betty Holloway. I know you did a tour of Montclair, a trolley tour. Mm -hmm. About what? Before COVID. Um, 2019, we did. Right. Uh -huh. Did we go past the Howe House? I don't remember. We did. <laughs> we did. The Howe House, we adapted part of that tour from the Montclair History Center's uh, hometown history tour. Uh -huh. and it's on that tour, uh -huh. and we adapted it. We got permission to use sites from their tour, and so we were up there on uh, Claremont Avenue, and uh, Jane was on that tour with us, right, Jane? She was on that tour. <laughs> she was on that tour with us. So, yeah, that trolley tour has got had quite a, a second life. People always talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I just had a question about the house as it is right now. How is the structure, and is it in good shape? Is it in bad shape? And how do we help? I mean, you you can see it online because it's it's on real estate web web pages, and uh, it was just sold. It's been renovated a few times. You know, right now it's nice and clean drywall on the inside. You know, I. There's tenants in it, and I think that gives us some time to raise more money to pay the um, bridge builders back. Um, but I think the hope is that we'll be able to return at least parts of it back to what it would have looked like in the 17 and 1800s. But that's going to entail moving renovations that have been made in the last decade or two. And how you can help is to donate. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's a there are a lot of there's a lot of information both. Things at the library, the Montclair History Center, and of course, the Friends of Howe House in the back table. Um, so don't miss that. Uh, I just want to compliment the panel. Very well done tonight, and all of the participants seem to be really knowledgeable about the uh, Howe House. I was wondering, um, what is the what were the plans for the Howe House that? prompted the bridge builders to go into action and build, in, to, to purchase it. And what are the build, bridge builders anyway? Who are they? Well, that, that's actually a couple questions. So okay. well, let's, start with, let's start with the um, plans for the house. Sure. Um, I feel like, am I allowed to put Reverend Anya on the spot and ask her to to, to speak to that, or Amina, we have our, our we have our board like president. <laughs> so we have friends of the Hal House. Um, sure, I'm glad to talk. Thank you. That's that's sort of how you get the word Reverend in front of your name. I'm glad to talk. So uh, so when when our group went into action, we went into action because number one, the house was put on the market, and number two, the house was put on the market with a investor's, attention investor's sign on, on the uh, real estate material, which is, uh, is dangerous. Uh, now, of course, the home did have some protections that investors probably couldn't have done that much to it, but who knows? You never really know. You don't want to be attracting that kind of interest in business. So that's when we went into action. The, the, the other piece is that this home, if you look deeply in the history, I'm not going to go into all of it now because that would be a very long speech, but the home has been at risk multiple times over the years. Mm -hmm. And so when you tell that story of how at risk the home has been, people who care about African American history in Montclair, this whole panel, tons, tons of more people, half the people in this room have already been involved, say, how can I help? What can I do? And the bridge builders came forward, honestly, because there were how many times? Like five times when we thought we're about to lose the house. 
Um, and we had, we had done everything we could and we we're about to lose a house. We've done everything we can and we're about to lose a house. Um, and we finally just said, please, anyone who has a whole lot of money that they can throw our way right now, <laughs> we'll pay you back, uh, but not immediately. And that's when the bridge builders stepped forward. And I won't, uh, I won't share their names at this space because I, I don't f feel that they've given us the privilege to do so. But they are two incredible families that have uh, gifted us with the potential to do something for the James Howe House well into the future because of very, very <laughs> wondering what um, the status was of efforts to get the house on the state and national registers of historic places and looking at the possibility of grants and so forth. That's in process. So we submitted an application to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection a few months ago and you know these processes don't move quickly. So and that's I think at this point, now that we've purchased it, it's, it's fine that it moves slowly, um, uh, but that's, that's in process. Now, I, I think your question about grants is a good one because you know, the more status the house has, the easier it will be to obtain money from different grant giving agencies. So we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> So real quick, I was looking for something, though that's why you saw me flipping through the newsletters and I found on the front page what I was looking for. <laughs> and it said, and this is talking about the Crane Homestead, in the rear of the house was another building. This was the slaves' quarters, for slavery was not abolished in New Jersey until 1820. This building was occupied by several generations of slaves and then by their descendants and the status of family servants. So I just wanted to share that. So information does exist. Thank you, um, With all of this extensive, remarkable, incredible depth of research going on, I was wondering if we know, if do we know if there are still any descendants of James Howe or any of his relatives, descendants of them or descendants of anyone who ever knew James Howe still living anywhere and if so have they been contacted and are they aware of these efforts well janice just revealed that she is related to the house i don't know if you just got here we were talking about that earlier but um one of the daughters well we i believe one of the children a uh, mary mary and oliver and so then that adds another line and i have olivers in my dna matches as well so uh, we're working on it and trust me, when I find out, you'll know. Um, so this, this is a story I'd love to share uh, related to that. When I did the, the Montclair, Jane, as a matter of fact, invited me to do the um, Alice Huey family. Um, and so she, it was posted online on the Montclair History Center's site. And lo and behold, I think it was maybe a year or so after the, uh, the presentation had been online, one of the family members who was doing uh, research uh, found us. So we found a link to the Hui family that are living in Long Island. Now, I'm saying the Hui family, but you may be more familiar to know that she was, uh, Alice Hui Foster was the founder of the Montclair YWCA. So that is the family that I'm speaking of. So I am hoping that the same thing is going to happen as a result of the showing of this talk uh, through the uh, library, that a family member who has been doing some research will contact us, and uh, it'll make it all easy for us. That's just one route that I'm hoping for. Well, when I, got, when I assembled this panel here, I said to them, we're not going to have all the answers, but we're going to start asking the questions. And so this is the beginning of a discussion, a community discussion that I hope will continue and that we will 
continue to have these scholars and others come back and share their insights and the fruits of their research with us. And I'm, I'm just so grateful and so happy that you came tonight um, and shared what you're doing with us um, about this really important community treasure. And also that all of you came um, to hear about it. Uh, and I just wanted to say that uh, if you are excited by this program, please take a look at the library's many other offerings for Black History Month. Um, we're going to have an open book, open mind, author conversation uh, with the co-author co of His Name is George Floyd on February 25th at 4 p.m. And he's uh, the Washington Post White House correspondent. And the adult school also has a free online class going on on February 14th on Valentine's Day. What better way to spend <laughs> Valentine's Day? Um, at 6.30 p.m. about African American women leaders of the New Jersey Civil Rights Movement. And um, we also have, we have a lot of other really amazing things going on. Um, and I say I have one last question. Although I it's I really an announcement do. from our friends of Palace. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Thank you to our panel. Thank you very much, you guys. Did a wonderful job. To the <laughs> I just wanted to share. If you wanted to follow along with us, we do have a website. It's www.friendsofthehowhouse. That's h o w e house org. We also have an Instagram page. Um, so if you're looking to keep up with our events, our fundraising efforts, if you wish to just volunteer your services or time to help us out, we'd appreciate that. And look what I got, y'all. I just want to say, as a 20-year resident of Montclair, who's always been fascinated by the Howe House, as well as a librarian here at the library, how very grateful I am to the people at the Friends of Howe House for preserving this treasure for us. And to all of you scholars for all of the time that you are donating to finding out about it. Thank you. Thank you.